food and entertainment. Friday, May 10th at the Hartford Club. I'm Barbara Henry, first selectman in the town of Roxbury, and I'm asking you to join me and other local leaders across the state of Connecticut as we race to give back. Get the details at triplecrownct.com. I'm still hearing the video in the background. Welcome to the Municipal Voice, CCM's radio podcast in collaboration with WNHH 103.5 FM, connecting Connecticut's municipalities. We're your source for news on the municipal level across the state of Connecticut. I'm your host, Matt Ford. Be sure to like this video and let us know what you think in the comments below. So, with a Democratic legislature and a new governor, Connecticut has had many calls for re regionalization. Uh, some proposals didn't pass this year. Regionalism is still alive and well. Uh, in our councils of government across the state. Joining us today is Carla Mento, Executive Director of the South Central Regional Council of Governments and a former mayor of Hamden. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Um, so the SCROG, as, as it's shortened, is 15 municipalities in South Central Connecticut. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the COG and what it does? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know uh, yeah. what the COG is, and sometimes that, that I certainly be, didn't before I started be getting good. more into this, you know, realm yeah. of, of the world. Yeah, yeah. We, we, well, that's because we're not really kind of public facing. We're really serve the 15 municipalities uh, mm -hmm. that run from along the coastline from Madison to Milford and going north up to Meriden, so okay. centered around New Haven. And we've been together uh, those 15 towns since 1960, the same okay. year that counties were abolished in in Connecticut, though they never were very robust uh, as yeah. far as government functions. So they exist only as uh, geographies at this point. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 1985, the name was changed. It originally was the um, planning agency of uh, South Central Connecticut. Okay. It became SCROG, South Central Regional Council of Governments, quite a mouthful. Now, is that just a, a name change or was there some sort of change in the structure at that point? The legislature um, began to call uh, for it formalized what, formal what that formalized. sort of organization would look like. Yeah, because yeah. by statute we exist, but mm -hmm. it's a voluntary association, almost like a chamber of commerce, in mm -hmm. that the towns have to decide whether to join. Now, it's been steady, the same 15. Mm -hmm. We didn't get merged in the last round of mergers. Uh, so now there are nine councils of government in the okay. state. There's about 400 nationwide. Mm -hmm. And they originated when the federal uh, transportation people would start building highways in the 70s and 80s, Mm -hmm. um, and not notify the local officials. And uh, this gives power to the mayors in a collective body yeah. to determine what are the priorities within that region for federal funding. Mm -hmm. So we really, we are planners and programmers. We really don't build anything. Yeah. People think we have some kind of authority, but no, we really just convene folks. We try to yeah. establish consensus among really pretty disparate uh, municipalities. But I've got to say from my six years sitting there at the table as mm -hmm. mayor of Hamden and also now nine years that I've been the executive director, people, the, the representatives from the, the towns, which are the mayor's first selectmen or town managers, they come and they, they check their parochialism at the, at the door. They, yeah. they think regionally um, and just about everything is done by consensus. So it's it's really yeah, quite a, quite a remarkable thing to watch. Yeah. And, and you have the unique perspective of having been on both sides of that yes. equation too. Yes. Which you know, I think speaks well to the, the organization. If you were on the other side for six years and you, you signed up to be part yeah. of it, it must have been working pretty well. Yeah, I think my hero was uh, Mayor Menino, who was the urban mechanic. So I like to, you know, get inside the hood and figure out how everything works. So uh, yeah. that's really my my thing is to to really understand the operations and the services of municipal government. It's quite complex and uh, quite interesting. Yeah, uh, you mentioned um, that it started the same year uh, that we got rid of government. So Functionally, what's what's the difference between a cog and and a county, say in another state where they ha still have counties? Yeah, well, counties, of course, um, uh, derive tax revenue. Okay. Could you imagine in Connecticut if no, we, if we, we we've talked about another of layer right of taxes? Yeah, uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. So that that no one will ever go there. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we get federal funding, probably about uh, 60, 70 percent of our funding okay. from the federal government, from DOT and FHWA. Uh, Federal Highway Administration, mm -hmm. um, and some FTA, uh, Federal Transit is, uh, Administration. Uh, but uh, we beginning in, thank God, right around the time I came, uh, we started uh, being not exclusively a transportation agency, but, mm -hmm. but started to do more in the way of land use and environment. And eventually with the Moore Commission, 
uh, beginning to do this uh, shared services mm-hmm. studies and, and trying to see where we can get towns to do things together, there being, you know, 169 little Lord Fifekins. Yeah. Um, so another thing that uh, Scrog recently voted was to establish a committee to develop a 15-town strategy for affordable housing. So that sounds like it's a new thing for you guys. Uh, the region has many towns falling under an important 10% threshold of affordable housing. Uh, what is Scrog going to look at in this committee, and what is the importance of affordable housing in South Central Connecticut? You know, I think the importance has been demonstrated by so many studies, and it mm-hmm. would be redundant for me to, to go into. I mean, I can point to the, the ALICE study, the mm-hmm. uh, Assets Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. In other words, there's yeah. people that are employed, but they don't make enough money to really mm-hmm. to, to, um, to afford housing. Uh, the benchmark is supposed to be 30% of your household income. Mm-hmm. Uh, no more than that. Go to housing. There's so many people that are 50 That doesn't and apply to you. Yeah. So it's been studied yeah. We know, we know that, the pro- that we know Alice the study, is that a federal study? What is, where is that? Alice, Alice, um, hmm, that's a good question. I, I know it's been done on, on Connecticut wide, um, yeah. but I don't, I believe there are uh, variants of it in, mm. in other places. But, but if but, someone wanted to find it, they could look up Alice, Connecticut, and yeah, they probably could study the United, United Way would definitely The United it. Way. Yes, All right. yes. Um, but there are so many studies that have, that have come out. Um, I, on the board of Data Haven, they've, mm-hmm. you know, they've come up with tremendous statistics on this yeah, as well. Yeah, good stuff there. Survey statistics. Um, so we know there's a problem, um, and it's now going to be rolling up our sleeves and doing as we're doing with uh, many of the other areas that we're looking into. We're, we're really conveners, mm-hmm. facilitators. We'll bring in the experts. We've already yeah. lined up a bunch of folks to start coming in. Some of the city of New Haven will draw from from their task force and what the people that they brought in, mm-hmm. and we'll have a discussion. And some of the towns have started. Uh, surprisingly, even some of the suburban towns have made initiatives. They're they're doing really good things because they realize that their own kids are being raised mm-hmm. in their communities can't afford to live there, uh, and they also realize that their workforce uh, has to come yeah. from afar. So. I think the I think we're at a tipping point where um, it, the region realizes that this is a problem. Yeah. So I think we can sit around, uh, talk to experts, and I see it as at least a year long mm-hmm. um, uh, type of um, thing. But, but we really won't be setting the agenda or setting. We'll just be um, facilitating, facilitating, and, yeah. and letting the towns tell us what we're asking for now is representatives from each town, and then we'll also some of them have task forces already mm-hmm. in some of the towns, and we'll. We'll layer those in, and we'll just try to uh, do as we do on many topics, um, come with best practices, uh, determine where the consensus is, and see if we can make recommendations for implementation. But we can't actually do yeah. the implementation. But uh, I, I think they'll, they'll arrive at uh, yeah. some uh, issues that will move forward in a very positive direction. That sounds good. Um, speaking of like task forces and stuff at, at separate towns, uh, New Haven City Plan Commission Chair Ed Madison has said that monoculture of housing is not sustainable. Young people cannot stay. Uh, just last week, though, New Haven Milf- Milford area was cited by the National Association of Realtors as a top place for millennials to move. Um, would increasing housing stock allow the millennials to stay in the area more? Do you think, or what's what's? Uh, I I think yes, of course. I, I think that uh, Ed's right. I mm-hmm. think that. Um, I, I think it's wonderful that uh, New Haven and Milford are drawing millennials. I think that's been intentional. I know mm-hmm. that, uh, that the towns uh, have been, particularly New Haven, have been trying to create that um, that culture, that would yeah. uh, that environment that would uh, draw young people. Uh, now to get them to stay, another piece of the puzzle is going to be uh, more housing. Math, I mean, we're housing, coming yeah. out of a recession and there wasn't much building going on, but. Certainly in New Haven now, there's lots of apartments. There's lots of stuff going on, yeah. Uh, what, uh, I think it'll spread um, probably to the inner ring suburbs, but I think some of the outer ring suburbs also see the need, uh, I believe, to the Shoreline East and the Hartford mm. Line uh, and the transit-oriented, transit-oriented development. development is a big one, we'll yeah. Also push that. I think that uh, accessory housing is, is going to be not such a heavy lift. Oh, uh, accessory, input, what's accessory housing? That, that's where you uh, allow either your uh, in-law or your child or your grandparent to you build a little okay, little, little multi-generational space housing yes, yes. okay that's, that's um that. in other words if you if you're stuck with kind of single family housing throughout the the, the entire town mm-hmm. there's very little in the way of apartments another way to be intergenerational and and you know uh facilitate affordable housing yeah by creating these uh and then there's co-housing something that uh, bethany has been tell me, tell me a little bit about that co-housing 
This would be groups of people that uh, live together and share facilities. Okay, uh, but that aren't related necessarily aren't or related. in a relationship right. per se. It, it's a, right. a business arrangement? Uh, kind of, but yeah. a social arrangement. I don't yeah. Know. yeah, and the town would facilitate that by allowing for it. In the zoning. In the zoning, yeah. Okay. Same thing with the accessory dwelling. Most of the town oh, saw because it. currently it might be considered like an illegal boarding house or something if someone tried to do it that way? Yeah, or it would cease to be a single family home if it's, if okay. it's allowing so it's a, zoning to allow. It. Usually, it's by, usually it's by kitchens. Oh, you know, okay. You set up a second kitchen. Okay, it's two family home now. Yeah, if it, if it doesn't have a kitchen, it's not a real yes apartment. Oh, uh, yeah. I've I've definitely been in some not apartment apartments that had that that issue. Yes, in my day. So um, so I I, th I think it's going to go well, and I think that uh, yeah, it sounds like different we'll, towns uh, are bringing different ideas to the table and and their expertise. That's that's what has been happening, Mark, as we get together the, the finance directors, the IT directors, the uh, we've been doing this for a year now, mm -hmm. um, uh, the purchasing agents, and ideas are bubbling up. Um, really, I don't think that uh, the towns and, and the mayors and first selectmen, are, there's, I know what it's like. Mm -hmm. They run around like with your hair on fire, and they don't get a chance to, um, I think they have so many people coming at them, pitching different yeah. things. So if we can vet and come up with things like the Green Bank has all kinds of mm -hmm. great programs. Uh, for instance, if you're a municipal building and you put solar on, they will. Um, the Green Bank will will take finance the installation, mm -hmm. finance the buying of the solar panels, finance the maintenance over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what the town does is has to buy back the electricity for use in that building. Yeah, this isn't selling to the grid. This is use in a municipal building. Okay, but at half the cost. Oh, that's because it's subsidized. Okay, so we had. 37 sites submitted by our towns um, for for uh, looking at whether they are suitable for mm -hmm. solar. Uh, we found another situation where um, there's a virtual accounts payable system okay. that uh, works that you get a 1% rebate just as mm -hmm. you would on a reward card okay. if you pay electronically. It pays the vendor faster, okay. and sometimes the vendor pays it uh, pays a fee for that and sometimes the card pays a fee or and this is slip. aimed at the municipal yeah, market and think about it municipalities purchase a lot of stuff yeah so yeah. if, if uh, the one that's been successful at this so far is Brantford and that was mm -hmm. great that you have sort of a medium-sized city that has a system like that so it's uh, let's see I believe they're uh, the people that have this are coming into town on, on the 15th and 16th and meeting with about six or seven of our towns okay. because it's a no-brainer it's free and you get money back oh it's a free service yeah yeah, because they get 1%. Too. They, they get a the cut on, on the <laughs> yeah, yeah. transaction. So, so we're finding things like that that I think are real, um, you know, no-brainers, no and they're best practices already in some yeah. other towns, and that's the most credible thing that can happen. Mm -hmm. My saying, oh, this is a good idea, do it, means nothing. It, but another town did it, and it's did, working. Did it, it's working, yeah. and, um, and they vouch for it to uh, the other towns goes, you know, the, the bandwagon effect, uh, you know, occurs after yeah. that. So it's not really, we're not getting to the point of merging services yet mm -hmm. or consolidating things, or, uh, but we're starting to coordinate the same software platforms. We're starting to find these best practices yeah. that all of them adopt. They're all working on cybersecurity now. It's a yeah. real, real big you issue. Know, a, lot, a lot of new issues that just... Yeah, separate towns that haven't had to deal yeah. with before. And so, so it's shared services, but I, you know, I, I wish yeah. we could jump to the point of you know two animal shelters coming together. Or we yeah. tried, but I think what we're doing is forming the basis yeah. by this trust that's being developed yeah. by this communication channel of their meeting, um, and when they meet as uh, specialties um, in terms of finance directors or IT yeah. directors, the mayors know everything going on. We we send everything to the mayors, um, yeah. and they're included in everything. So. We keep that dual level um, going, but I think that when it's been when the finance director says this is a good idea, Mayor, mm -hmm. you know that that's gonna uh, those better. There's a better chance of adoption. Yeah. So before you can really get to the shared services, you're sharing information. I think so. We're building so trust. All kind of. Uh, we're doing some this... school stuff. I know mm -hmm. one of the questions. Uh, right, we'll be talking about that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. What was you know we, we had once uh, said when we looked at this in 2014 that we think where the money really could be saved is between. The towns and the boards of education. Yeah, we, yeah. Let's let's and get that, into that. That's true, but we don't have really the channels uh, to the board of education that we do to the town. So okay, so I'm you, taking not, an incremental not approach at the to table this. Most of the time, we're we're doing a little bit of work with the boards of ed, and we're building up the trust there. But remember, we'd be coming to the boards of ed saying, "We represent the towns. We're here to help you." 
I'm not sure that they some some towns some towns have a, have a friendlier very, environment, and sometimes it's confrontational. Yeah, absolutely, it, it depends. So what we are doing some um, food waste composting and food waste diversion uh, in some of the schools. I believe mm -hmm. Hamden and Woodbridge are starting it, and we hope to develop that. So we think that'll be a way to begin to work with the school systems and get to kind of foot in the door, foot in the know, door, develop and, trust in a, in a working relationship. But the idea originally was that. Things like HR when on the non-certified personnel, uh, some of the finance function, that a lot of those could be done together. Yeah. Right at, now, at, the, the board has one and the town has one. In most cases. Yeah. There, there are some cases in which they have combined already and they can serve as best practices. Um, hmm. Some have put together and then fell apart. So it's, you know, remember it's structurally a problem in that the, um, the town only has bottom line authority on the mm -hmm. budget. And really, the, the Board of Education reports to the state. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, essentially, so, the town hands over a check to the Board of Ed, and that's the last they, they yeah. see of that money. Or So some of it is structural, yeah. I think, in, in terms of trying to get uh, the cooperation. But we're trying to get at it um, a little at a time by, sh again, showing that it works on the town side, mm -hmm. because that's where we have the in and we have their trust. We've been working yeah. with them for 50 years. Uh, same towns. In, yeah. in case of Wallingford, same mayor for 30 years. So. Yeah. And known, known some people for a while, certainly. Um, you mentioned uh, the uh, food composting thing. Is that that would end up saving towns money on garbage collection? Is that sort of the idea? Yeah, we. I mean, obviously, uh, it's good for the environment, but yeah, we, we've uh, another thing that that's uh, taken off is uh, we introduced the towns to um, textile recycling. Okay. And um, it's picked up with the regular trash, and so what you're does, talking about clothes, 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 yeah. uh, rugs, things Sheets, like that. Yeah. yeah right. Right. And what happens is you want, now that you have problems with recycling, what used to be a money maker is now you have to pay yeah. for because of the, the whole contamination China issues thing. and yeah. yes, and all of that. Um, so how do we solve that problem right away? Mm -hmm. Well, until we get the types of facilities locally that were in China to, to sort through all this stuff. To make and, it clean enough. Yes, yeah, we clean did an enough episode and all that. Back. And, and, and be able to recycle that stuff properly and reuse it. Uh, or also the, the whole circular economy in mm -hmm. terms of developing better packaging that doesn't have to be go through all yeah, that. Yeah, businesses actually want that material. Yes, and that's happened with mattress recycling. We mm -hmm. made sure we got the word out on that. Um, so um, on, on the textile recycling, what, what that does is removes from the waste stream. Mm -hmm. Now, you're paying a tonnage cost, a tipping fee, yeah, it's for, by weight. for your waste, right? Yeah. So stuff's kind of heavy. So if you take that out of your waste stream. You take waste, out the clothes, you take stream, out the rugs, and then and the by composting, the way, and, you take out and the they, food. And they pay you. Um, it's $40 a ton. Uh, for textiles. To, back to the municipality for the textile pickup. And mm -hmm. it's a service that's free to, to the residents. So again, it seems yeah. like a, a pretty win-win. There are people that are saying, well, I'd like to bring it to goodwill. And mm -hmm. we think it ultimately winds up in those types of facilities. But th what's good here is you can put the real raggedy stuff in, too. Um, mm -hmm. That probably goodwill does not really want. So the, the ones picking it up, this is a private company that does this? Yes, it's a private There's like company. kind of brokers, and they, they know who could use yes. three tons of old yes. clothes or whatever. Yes. Um, and um, so once you remove it from the waste stream, now you're reducing your tonnage mm -hmm. um, for your waste and therefore offsetting the new cost that you're now incurring for recycling. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be our short-term strategy. Is to get as much weight out of those garbage cans as possible Absolutely. into so, other... So the next target is composting. Okay. And, and there's all kinds of different ways to for do the, that. For the textiles, um, how, how do people actually do that? Do they... They, they are, have, like in Hamden now, um, North Haven is doing it, mm -hmm. a bunch of towns are doing it, but uh, in Hamden, living there, you get a pink bag... Okay. Uh, in the mail, and you get instructions, and then as you put your pink bag out full, they replace it with another pink bag. So um, you put it out on garbage day? On garbage you know, day. So there's garbage, recycling, pink bag of clothes. Yes. Okay. Um, um, and is that like a, does the company that runs that thing come they, around with their own yes, uh, truck and do, yes, do routes? And, and um, it's $20 if the town doesn't use a GPS um, system uh, that they guess the town uh, allows that to be done and that way they check every place they're doing pickups and mm -hmm. they they know oh i know what it is it's the trash people check where where they see the pink bags and that allows alert the, them that, that allows the rooting uh for the the private company that picks up the pink bags 
Yeah, it's pretty wow. cool. Kind of so same day, almost real time. Yes. Yeah. They're saying yeah. today so there's the, a bag there. Go, there's, go grab. They're it. getting very ingenious about this. Um, so somebody came to us too with um, food waste, mm -hmm. and they, I, I, I couldn't believe this. It was a bag again, mm -hmm. and they said you put this bag with your food waste in your trash, mm -hmm. and it's a separate colored bag, mm -hmm. and it'll go into the compactor, the compacting truck. Mm -hmm. I thought, how does the bag, which yeah. probably has some air in it, not pop? Well, somehow they've created a compostable bag. Okay. It won't uh, break. Okay. And I don't know how it doesn't break, but it's compostable. But so we're still looking into this. Okay. We haven't bought into this yet. Um, but it, it then the only problem is now you see you avoid the separate driver, avoid mm -hmm. the separate truck, and you in the same even yeah. container uh, because. You're, yeah. you're replacing what would have not been in the bag. It just would have been. Yeah, with anything, always, the challenge is always getting people to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you do it this way, and the trouble is now somebody has to, when it all arrives at the, uh, the place where it's facility, being disposed yeah. of, the facility, somebody has to pull out these bags out of the garbage, green bags. I think okay. They are. Yeah. So I we haven't bought into that but, yet. But they're but saying that it works it, it's an interesting yeah. technology, um, because the other technologies were. Buckets. Yeah, separate. You filled a bucket. The, so it comes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then the, the you they'd pick up the bucket and they'd give you a new empty bucket. And, mm -hmm. uh, and but you need sort of a whole nother truck to pick that up and a whole nother you know so layer of so of somebody figuring out yeah. how to piggyback on the existing collection was pretty pretty yeah. amazing. I know in, uh, in New Haven, uh, Public Works actually gives away um, composting bins to residents. Yes, that uh, so you can do it at home. Yep. Obviously, apartment dwellers. That's not a, a you know possibility for them so but, this but sort of service would be great we have asked the capital region purchasing council all our mem all our towns are members mm -hmm. um to bid uh specs out for composting bins so that we can get the cheapest price mm -hmm. and see if we can also get a grant for it um so that we can get those spread out to, uh, yeah. for people who want to do it individually too yeah I and mean, there's certainly the fancy models out there yeah. uh one of my coworkers is really into fancy stuff and he has his that does it real quick but mine is just a the one I got from the city, it, it's basically a, a, a circle you put together. Yes. The plastic has got holes in it, so it gets air through it. Mm -hmm. But it's a, a heavy-duty plastic circle you just kind of set on the ground, and you just build up a pile and turn it once a year, twice a year, and get uh, yeah compost yeah. for your garden. So we got to attack it from all different uh, uh, ways and in all different directions. Excellent. Let me pause for a moment to let you know that you are listening to The Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM, broadcasting live from downtown New Haven. We are streaming live on TuneIn Radio and NewHavenIndependent.org. We are also streaming live on Facebook Live. Just go to Facebook.com slash NewHavenIndependent or go to the CCM Facebook page. And you can watch us live on there. Um, so other big projects that are going on in the South Central region. Um, they're revitalizing uh, Tweed, Tweed mm -hmm. New Haven Airport. Uh, Garrett Sheehan, the president of Scrog, has said that it remains a priority for your organization. But it's not a done deal at this point. So what, what are the benefits of having Tweed at airlines rather than go to New York, Bradley, Providence? Let's talk about Tweed. Yeah, again, the studies are out there. Um, mm -hmm. I was on the uh, Connecticut Aviation Plan Advisory Board, and okay. obviously the state um, puts a lot of its resources into Bradley, and that's mm -hmm. that's very important facility. Um, but we are pitching for Tweed to be a, a secondary facility. Mm -hmm. And of course, this has been a problem in terms of runway length. Uh, yeah, decades. Uh, I remember being in law school in the '70s and working on papers on this stuff. Um, so some of the same problems still yeah. exist. I mean, how many times do you have a runway that's in two towns? Um, so it's a little unusual. Yeah, yeah. it is. It, so um, the usually we don't do much advocacy or any advocacy. Uh, we have CCM, uh, yeah. who is a tremendous partner, and they come to all our meetings yep. and they. They follow through on questions that everybody has, and all our people, all our towns are members. And then yep. we have cost, which is also very good, but they're for towns under 30,000. Mm -hmm. But they distribute to us all their stuff, and we send that around to the big cities as well. So the, everybody gets you know two sets of things, mm -hmm. um, and we let them do the advocacy because yeah. we, we work with the agencies. It's a little yeah, it, it, it's not necessarily the best role for you guys to fill. Like absolutely, you have absolutely we're more than nuts and bolts. Do the advocacy on yeah. behalf of those towns, right? And right. you're kind of facilitating so getting stuff done so, on a more but, local level. But, yeah. but Tweed has come up for vote, uh, in endorsing the runway extension, endorsing mm -hmm. a greater service, um, uh, many many times over the mm -hmm. years, going back to my time uh, serving on it as a mayor, 
and it's usually been a 14 to 1 vote with uh, and almost all votes are, are unanimous anyhow mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes on a technology matter Mayor Dickinson will, will be a, a dissenter mm -hmm. but the nicest of dissenters and East Haven usually is a nice dissenter who we understand everyone oh, understands specifically who we yes yeah. everyone understands their situation yeah. so uh, I don't know I hope there's a solution at some point but it's going to be a legislative uh, one at some point mm -hmm. and you know it's before the legislature now so other than to, to say yeah. that the goal is is a worthy one uh, to grow the economy in this yeah. area we looked at uh, we did a study of uh, freight possibilities and it's not much we're like maybe bringing tomatoes from Long Island and uh, heart yeah. heart transplants into Yale New Haven Hospital mm. um, but someday maybe uh, there could be some further freight development and, and some warehousing and distribution in that area yeah. uh, and that might benefit East Haven um, but we'll just have to see. I mean, it's not something that we can we can do studies. Yeah. We can uh, we can take a vote and and show that the the uh, towns support uh, the extension uh, expansion of of Tweed and mm -hmm. being able to get to to more hubs. But it's it's really not anything that uh, we can do anything about. Yeah, you can you can just talk about it. Get your, get your towns the information they need to. Yes, we have to leave the rest of it up to us at CCM. There's a lot of meetings going on. There's a lot, lot of one meetings. on Monday, and so we're involved in all of that. I mean, anything that uh, you know, I hope I don't sound like we're punting things, but you know, we're, we're monitoring, we're on top of these mm -hmm. things, but we just we're just ready in case we're called upon, or we'll be ready to to fund a study because um, mm -hmm. we can use our transportation dollars that way. But you know, we really don't have the power of a, a vote. Yeah. So talking about transportation dollars, uh, Scrollick has released transportation plans that are uh, kind of more grounded than necessarily uh, Tweed would be. Yes. Um, what do you see as an ideal situation for our roads and, and railways? Well, you know, there's two obvious things, and, and that would be a state of good repair. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are major projects. And the statewide major projects, of course, are the, the Hartford Viaduct, uh, the um, Mixmaster, and Waterbury. Mm -hmm. And the very old bridges on the New Haven, uh, New York line, railroad yeah. line, uh, that are really of concern. Uh, if they get stuck up uh, yeah. in an so up, is that, up position. So the north and the shoreline sort of? Uh, going from New Haven to New York. Uh, okay. there, there are several really old bridges, 100-year-old bridges. 100-year-old bridges. And they have to open for boats because they're low. Mm -hmm. And so if they stay up and the trains can't get through, we're going to uh, have they, they, a they, real they, problem. The old bridges have gotten stuck in the, in the up position before? I, I don't know that they they have, but I think the concern is they might. They could. They could, yes. And it probably yes. happened in other places, I'm sure. Yes. So um, so those are the two things, but uh, mm -hmm. understanding, again, that we're programmers and planners and, and not really the um, the people that, that uh, we use the funding uh, for prioritization and for programming, but we don't, um, we don't have control over the funding. And so it all depends, again, on the legislature and... On the federal level, mm -hmm. the FAST Act, which is the current Transportation Act, expires uh, September 30th, 2020. Mm -hmm. So will they get something going, or will it be extensions, uh, continuing yeah. resolutions, continuing the FAST Act? That happened. So what is the, the FAST Act currently doing? That's the whole transportation funding. Um, for, it's a five-year program okay. by the feds. And about every five years, they come up with some catchy a acronym. Okay, so, so it's sort of the same thing. Thing, but it's called net right now it's called fast and it might be the fast extension or might get a new acronym yes in the future all yes. right so we'll have to see what happens there and then of course it seems like every other week is infrastructure week and that never seems to happen so you know what will happen with that we don't know but we're at the mercy of you know the funding that the feds finally decide mm -hmm. upon and then the state transportation fund and it's underfunding uh, you know, the there was the constitutional amendment to to make a lockbox out yeah of it. Uh, that that's good, but um, you know what'll happen. We don't know. We're kind of agnostic as to where the revenue comes from, whether it's tolling or um, a gas tax increase yeah. or any other vehicle mileage tax or anything like that. But we do recognize that there is there are problems, and that that um, getting the infrastructure up to snuff would help the area a lot. And of course, the further behind you get the more costly it yeah, becomes, indeed. really. Deferring maintenance is not, not a great not idea. Not a great idea. Uh, speaking of that, on the more local level, uh, the governor's 30-30-30 plan, what do you think of that? Is it feasible in the near future? 
I think it's an aspiration. I think that mm-hmm. uh, whether it's feasible in the near future depends again on will there be a massive infusion of funds. Yeah, there's just so many things that would have to be done. Uh, sig- signalization, the tracks, uh, new rolling stock. Mm. You know, it, it's uh, it seems like it would so it's a- aspirational, but not necessarily likely at this point. Right, but I mean, it would be a tremendous. I mean, if we were, could really commute be commuting distance to New York City and to Stanford. It mm. would, make this area really boom um so it's it's a good aspiration it's just i don't know how feasible it is the, the studies would have to be done that's yeah. where uh probably we won't come in because it'll probably be a state study yeah i know we uh, had a someone from the dot talking to us yesterday at one of our meetings and started getting into tolls and, and congestion pricing and that's like a whole other topic mm-hmm. that we probably do a whole show on but yes there's a lot of big ideas kind of being kicked around right now because it's a some unprecedented situations in the state, really. Yes, uh, I mean, we only have a staff of six, and we're just reading and uh, studying and being ready for all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, does it feel like there's there's more going on right now, kind of? It does, it does. Just, you know, I think that's caused by kind of the, the fiscal problems at the state level, like it's forced us to kind of look at things, or is it technology mm, or a little bit of both? A little bit of both, and I'd say maybe a third factor is coming out of the recession. Mm. there's even the possibility of doing some of this stuff now it couldn't be thought of during the, the height of the recession yeah uh you mentioned the long uh range transportation plan before um so in in that plan it's a long range plan we plan out from today through uh 2040 uh it appears that you know technology is changing rapidly in the way we commute um are there any plans in there for the advent of self-driving cars that sort of thing Again, it, it, we see the feds and the state taking the lead on that, and mm-hmm. w- we'll react to it when it gets to that point. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's still a lot of uh, testing uh, and tweaking that needs to be done. So I don't yeah. know that yeah, it's, it, not I, it's not, on, it's not, not happening, happening next year, tomorrow right? or next year. Uh, it's, it's, but we're watching it carefully. There's yeah. a forum coming up in Hartford uh, in June. You know, we're keeping up with it uh, so that we can follow everything about it same yeah. thing with bike and ped i mean um it started where everybody was just striping bike lanes right mm-hmm. that's turning out that it's turning out to be something that you really should have protected bike lanes if mm-hmm. you want to be have the bicycle rider be safe i mean yeah. you've got these several ton vehicles seems like everybody yeah. has suvs and you've got you know a hundred pound bike or something or a fifty pound bike. So it's that's kind of been a, part of a like fair... the learning curve. Like first they put yes. it's like oh yeah. maybe we need to. Yeah, yeah. I, I think and and you know uh, it it seems to be a trend now in the big cities to go to the electric scooters and mm-hmm. motorized bikes. And so I think we have to see how it all shakes out. But certainly we've been encouraging com- a complete streets model to the mm-hmm. towns. Um, but it's up to them to adopt, and most of them have. Um, but I think there's going to be a, a lot further. Um, development of uh, uh of the way that we use the right of way in the yeah. future uh, there's a bus study going on now called mm-hmm. move new haven but it's for the whole region okay. and you know they're looking at um dedicated lanes or uh bypass uh signals so that when the bus approaches a signal it'll it'll it can kind of go through yeah uh to to get the headways um between each bus to be shorter and shorter and therefore people would use transit because mm-hmm. it'd be more reliable so that's all being looked at. Of course, yeah. there's tremendous success from uh, New Britain to Hartford in their busway. Mm. Um, so bus rapid transit. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's so, been a, a big project up there. Yeah, so there's there's tremendous mix of things yeah. going on. And I think each town is going to have to see what works for them. Uh, some yeah. towns, just the way they're configured, uh, you know, it, it won't work. It will work uh, depending on, you know, whether there's room to, to widen right-of-ways to allow for a pedestrian and bicycle. Uh, yeah. We've gotten super into trails. Uh, we have a hundred really? okay, yeah, yeah, trails mapped, and in, uh, in, they're on the website. In, the frog, in, yeah. in your towns, yeah. Our website has all our plans, all our programs, okay. all our uh, reports, and uh, these hundred maps. Yeah. Of, uh, every trail in the region, except for some of the state ones, which already have their own websites. Yeah. And so these are on on town land. These are what are these? Yes, they're all they're within our fifteen towns, mm-hmm. and uh, they are with GPS mapped. And mm-hmm. every year we update them. We have a committee from the towns that helps us. And it's probably our only public-facing thing. Mm-hmm. We get lots of phone calls, and we have to stock these things all the time. But they yeah. can be printed off our website, which is www.scrcogscrog.org. .org. Yeah. So for the entire region, 
someone wants to go for a hike, they can go find a map of the oh, trail, it download has it. Photos. It has uh, the you know trailhead. It has the historical description. They're really cool. So you can really get a sense of what the what's going on in that place if that's an interesting one to you yes. on that day. Um, that's awesome. Uh, I'm going to guess that as part of the, you say you do a lot of research and stuff on Happy Towns, that those trails, aside from being beautiful and, and part of nature, that they have benefits to the town economically and stuff too. They, they, like, they could be a draw for residents to move to a town if yes, they, they know. Yes, people, people want to be near something yeah. that, where they can get um, passive recreation on and, uh, well, I should say active recreation, but um, go out in nature and. Well, yeah. the other thing that's happening is by mapping, you know, when you map, and we have mm -hmm. a very sophisticated GIS program that we've uh, helped, we, we got a grant for $700,000, and we spread it throughout mm -hmm. all the towns and brought them all up to the same high level of uh, GIS uh, work, geographic information okay. system. And now we're looking at connectivity of trails, because when you, you know, pictures mm -hmm. worth a thousand words, when you lay it on paper and you say, oh, well, those the, two the, are close the, to The trail other. in this town and this town yeah. are really only a mile apart. Right. So that's if we, if we connected it, we would have a continuous sort of. Yeah. And the other big issue we've been working on is coastal resilience. Coastal um, resilience. Okay. Yeah, because uh, we've got uh, seven coastal towns. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the scenario planning that's been done as to what uh, the convergence of a hurricane, high mm -hmm. tide, sea level rise, you've got some of the downtowns yeah. flooding. So uh, we're looking at green infrastructure as opposed to walls as ways okay. of, uh, so uh, dune restoration, marshland okay. restoration, um, as ways to um, to alleviate future flooding. Okay. And it's been we again got a seven hundred thousand dollar grant, another one from National Fish and Wildlife, it's okay. a competitive grant. We uh, worked with the Nature Conservancy and with the Bridgeport mm -hmm. region, and we did ten towns, and we must have teed up about two hundred um, projects that mm -hmm. could be done. And now, little by little, we're getting applying for the towns are applying for funding. Yeah. Um, to uh, to move those forward, uh, but that's you know we're getting a little complacent because we haven't had a hurricane in a while. Uh, uh, yeah, we might be due. You never know. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but people really get uh, interested in moving forward once we've had the actual experience of the storms. Yeah, and we've had Circa as a wonderful partner there. Mm -hmm. um, that's Yukon and um, Yukon and the D uh, the DEP. Mm -hmm. D -E -E -P. Um, have, have formed this uh, agency out at uh, the Yukon campus in um, Avery Point. In that sounds really, really interesting. And so just using environmental solutions in a lot of ways to help remediate yes. the flooding? Like, is, is that like dealing with like hardscape sort of issues? Like there's too much is paved and it runs right off into the drains and then well, shoots into the stuff? Is yes, that sort of yes, that can be it. Uh, though that also is a whole other uh, mm -hmm. area of study and we have those people mm -hmm. coming together and that's... Uh, MS4, that's Municipal ah, Stormwater. Yeah, that, yeah, it's a big one. Uh, and it's a big mandate on the towns right now. Yeah. So we're working with the towns. New Haven has done a wonderful job creating in an urban environment these little rain gardens mm. and um, uh, bio swales. So it's, it's, that uh, on, the, on the sidewalks. Sides right? of the yeah, road. Yeah, yeah. Like little, so, they're almost like little gardens. Yeah, so yeah. instead of having like a curb um, with a vegetated uh, area and the curb, the water doesn't get in because it's got a curb around it, yeah. these are recessed. And so, so the you water let it get drains, in and soak into yeah, the ground rather than stay on top of the asphalt. Right. Yeah. And so you're eliminating the sheet flow that um, that really can, can form. Can the, 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 the quick stuff that will form like a flash flood, if it yes. soaks in slowly and then releases slowly. It, you and know, and a, lot of the, a lot of the towns, particularly New Haven, have combined uh, septic, system, septic sewer and um, the storm sewer. Mm -hmm. And so it's all treated out in uh, the shore. Mm -hmm. And if you get a flash flood and it, it can't goes handle into, it all yeah and then then you get overflows into into long island and then so, the overflow is not just rainwater it's also the septic stuff can get into the yes yeah yes. Into the, new haven's building uh you know bioretention basins underground and they're doing i think they did 200 of these uh so we mm -hmm. use this as examples we also had east line mm -hmm. came in and they had done all these wonderful little tree wells okay uh, again dozens and dozens of them in their downtown so we will, in July, have a workshop and uh, try to show the towns in a practical way how to build these things and how mm -hmm. to do them inexpensively. And, and, and I assume you're helping them find federal funding for them, too? Um, or is it, that the goal? It's probably going to be state funding. Yeah. State funding, okay. Yeah. But, you, but you, as always, you're facilitating them yeah, we doing have, these things. We have, yeah. we have a whole, we get all the grant writers together, too. Mm -hmm. And that's been interesting because uh, in some towns it's very uh, 
dissipated and dis, what's the word uh, disparate in terms mm-hmm. of the um, all the department heads do their own grants and there's no yeah. central person and others it's a central person so we've been, again been getting everybody together we created a database of recurring grants mm-hmm. and we're sharing best practices yeah and I know for our membership which is all of the towns at this point uh, we have, we have grant, grant finder we have grant finder as well that they can find yeah. on our, our website which is yeah. also a good one yes it's very good excellent uh, is there any other issues that uh, Scrog wanted to talk about that you think well, are, are important? Let's see. Um, the o- only other thing that we've been uh, working on, mm-hmm. uh, well, is actually a couple of things. We're, we're just completing a tree study. Okay. So it be a tree canopy study. So we'll see where the gaps in the uh, tree cover are. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just finished an open space study. Um, yeah. We, believe it or not, are working with farmers. And okay. uh, we're identifying agricultural assets and okay. mapping them. We're identifying cultural assets uh, and tourism assets mm-hmm. and, and mapping them for our partner, Rex, uh, that does the economic development work. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, let's see, what else are we doing? Working so with, 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 when, with those studies of the, the thing, is, are you then handing them off to towns absolutely. to then figure out what, what how best to utilize that information? Yes. Yeah. They, they, there'll be a regional map, but they'll be town by town maps. So they mm-hmm. could use them as tourism, tourism maps. We okay. got the idea from North Brantford that had all of their agricultural, all their farm stands and all that laid out on yeah. a map. And we thought, let's do that for all That's the That's a good idea. Yeah. And uh, I'd say the only other thing would be we also do a lot of work in uh, hazard mitigation. Yeah. So we do it all the towns together instead mm-hmm. of each town having to do it. And uh, it's, they still get an individual plan, but they also get a regional plan. That sounds excellent. Yeah. Sounds like you're doing a lot of good stuff for them. Yeah, you're pretty busy, but it uh, it's it's exciting and it's fun and it's it's for me it's the kind of stuff I, I love to do to get into this kind of the operational aspects. Yeah. Municipal governing, we 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 love it here at CCM too. Yes, you do. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> the Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Malone is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry draws on the boards. I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out Facebook page and give us a like and watch out for CCM Chat series on YouTube. Just search for CCM Chats and you'll find them all in one convenient playlist. So thanks again, Carl. Thanks for being on the air. Yes, thank you, Matt. All right. I can paint pull it off. <laughs> no, it's fun. Today on CCM Chats, we're in Derby visiting the Parent Child Resource Center. What is the mission of your organization? to uh, save lives by passionately caring for children, families, and the community. What can you tell us about the history of your organization? The Parent Child Resource Center was established in 1975 to service children with mental health needs in the Lower Naugatuck Valley area of Ansonia, Derby, Seymour, and Shelton. Since that time, we've actually grown and now we serve over 40 communities throughout not only the valley, but the greater New Haven area. What kind of people reach out to your organization? So at the Parent Child Resource Center, we see Um, children ages birth to 18. Parents or guardians typically are the ones that are reaching out to us for services. We work with people that have emotional, social, behavioral issues, uh, focusing with the emphasis on children. Um, The type of kids we see usually are kids that have trauma, um, and that trauma may be the result of abuse or neglect. We see kids that have, you know, really significant behavioral issues at school. We see children that have anxiety, depression, Um, you know, more at-risk type of behaviors. We recently started a um, Today's Choices program focusing on kids with at-risk behaviors that has a substance abuse component. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, you know, in in our climate right now, there's a lot of kids dealing with suicide attempts, suicidal ideation, self harm. Um, So we see all of those children. So it sounds like there's a lot of different programs going on here. Yes. Um, So can you tell us about a few of those, like the day-to-day operations? Sure. So we have a child guidance clinic that focuses on individual family therapy with parent guidance. We also have an intensive outpatient program. So that's kids that come to therapy anywhere from nine hours to 15 hours a week in a group setting. So there are groups of um, children ages six to 18 that we do three different groups that run per day. Those kids that um, we see are either a step down from they've been in the hospital or we're trying to divert a hospitalization. Um, so there are a lot of acute children that we're seeing with um, you know, a wide gamut of needs. And does that take place here at the center, or do you go out into the community? So we also have community-based programs. So we have a parenting support services program that focuses on two different programs, um, Circle of Security and Triple P, that actually parent educators go into people's homes Mm -hmm. and teach them parenting skills. 
Uh, triple P, you mentioned that. What is what is Triple P? Though? It's a positive parenting program. So, positive parenting program, Triple P. Yes, All that's right, what it stands works. for. Um, we also have in-home clinical services for infancy to age six. So you have a, a clinician that goes into your home to work with you. What are you excited about for the Triple Crown Party? I'm just excited to get the you know PCRC, Parent Child Resource Center. People really know what we do mm-hmm. and to um, let people know all of the hard work we do and kind of tell our story. And hopefully raise a lot of money for a good cause. Yes. Don't forget to come on May 10th and support the Parent Child Resource Center and other great charities at the Connecticut Charity Triple Crown.